All right, so tonight we are going to begin a brand new series entitled A History of the Baptist. And you see that the, uh, the description below it also says, and the Bible they preserved. What we're going to be seeing over the next four weeks, including tonight, is a combination of Baptist history and interwoven with the Baptist history, we will see a history of the manuscripts of the Bible that became our King James Bible that we hold today. So it's going to be those two histories woven together. And the reality is you can't really study one without the other because they are so tightly woven together. Baptist history and the history of our Bible. And because uh, I want to make sure I get through the material, we're going to do this the same way we've done some of the other presentations before. I will not take questions or comments during the presentation, but I will always leave time at the end each week for anybody that wants to ask any questions. So you will have an opportunity to do that. So if you think of something you want to ask, then just jot it down and uh, we'll make sure we do that at the end before we finish tonight. So on your... On the screen up here, you see the title of our study, A History of the Baptist and the Bible They Preserved. The study that we're going to see actually has been a study of 30 plus years that I've been studying Baptist history and the history of our Bible. My very first book that I had published A Clash of Swords is, again, that interwoven history between Baptist and our Bible, where our Bible came from. There's no way, even in four weeks' time, that I'm going to be able to include everything that you could possibly talk about with the subject. So if you're interested, if you uh, attend Pinnacle Baptist Church in person, I'm going to give you a copy of the book if you don't already have one if you promise to read it within 30 days. That's the promise I always ask people to make. If you're willing to make that uh, promise and you're here in person, I'll give you a copy in person. If, if not, you can order it online. And I think we've got it on sale with Amazon right now for half price. It's normally $19.95. I think now it's $9.95 while we're going through this series if anybody wants a copy of it. Here are some of the things we're going to see as we go through this four-week series. First of all, Baptists are not Protestants. Most people think that uh, Baptists are Protestants. You're either Catholic or you're Protestant if you're a Christian. That's what most people think. But the truth is, Baptists are neither Catholic nor Protestant. And you'll see that as we go through the series. Secondly of all, the King James Version of the Bible came from Baptist manuscripts. The reason it is different than all those other modern versions of the Bible that are out today is because the version, the the Bible manuscripts that were given precedence were the ones that were maintained and preserved for hundreds of years by Baptist groups throughout Europe. The next one says John Calvin and Martin Luther learned about salvation by grace through faith from Baptists. It is said that the Protestant Reformation just sprang up from those two men reading the Bible for themselves and coming to the realization that salvation is not by works like the Catholic Church teaches, but that it is by grace through faith. And that they somehow just came upon that simply by reading their Bibles. Now I want to say that it is possible that someone just reading their Bible would come to that conclusion But the reality is both Martin Luther and John Calvin had already had the influence of Baptists in their study, in their background. They already knew what Baptists believed in their day. And you'll see some of the evidence of that before we finish. The next one says, Every modern English version of the Bible since 1881 is based upon corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts. The reason all those other modern versions of the Bible are different than our King James Bible is because they all give precedence to Roman Catholic manuscripts instead of the Baptist manuscripts. And those Catholic manuscripts, by the way, are uh, about 5% or fewer of all the manuscripts that exist, but the modern versions of the Bible give... uh, put more weight on those 5% of Catholic manuscripts than the vast majority of manuscripts that existed before that. 
Baptists have been called by many different names by their enemies. You'll see this too as we go through, uh, starting more next week than tonight. But Baptists have been called by different names in different places at different times. And on almost every occasion, it was their enemies that gave them those different names by which they're called. But you'll see that as we go through. The next one says, Baptists were the cause of the First Amendment. That is, right here in America, the Baptists are the reason that there was a First Amendment added to the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. Had it not been for the Baptists, uh, we probably would not have had a First Amendment. And before we finish, we'll talk about that as well. And there's a lot more we'll cover. I don't know if you can read this or not, but on the right is a quote by Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time. And uh, Charles Spurgeon had this to say, We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. Nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. We have, never been, we have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we, are, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute uh, the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government. And we will never make the church, although the queen the despot over the consciences of men. So here is one of the most famous preachers from all of church history who says that Baptists were never part of the Roman Catholic Church. We never had to come out of the Catholic Church because we were never part of the Catholic Church. So Baptists are not Catholics and Baptists are not Protestants. Protestants, of course, are called Protestants because they were protesting the Catholic Church when they left the Catholic Church. So he says Baptists are neither Catholic nor Protestant. I think over the next few weeks you'll see that history bears out what he has said to be true. When I was in 10th grade, world history class at Mount Vernon Christian School, a good Christian school, my teacher was uh, Mr. Probst. And Mr. Propes was the best history teacher I ever had all the way through uh, high school and college, either one. He was a great history teacher. But I remember when we came to the series, uh, rather the, uh, the chapters in the, the history book on the Middle Ages, he taught us what was going on in the Roman Catholic Church, all the corruption that was going on. And it appeared from everything that our textbook said, which, by the way, was a Christian textbook, uh, it appeared that in spite of the fact that uh, all of these horrible things were going on within the Catholic Church, it seemed as though there was no other church during the Middle Ages. You were either Catholic or you weren't Christian at all. And yet we know that the Catholic Church was not teaching the truth. They were preaching a gospel of salvation by works. And I remember as a teenager, uh, at least understanding enough that the light went off in my head and I raised my hand and asked a question. I still remember to this day where I was sitting in Mr. Probe's classroom when I asked the question. Over on the side, uh, first seat in the row, and I said, Mr. Probes, um, if the Catholic Church was all that there was during the Middle Ages but they were preaching a false gospel. Where were the true Christians? Was there not a, 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 a real church? Was there not, were there not real Christians during the Middle Ages? And as, as wonderful a Christian school as that was, and as wonderful a teacher as Mr. Propes was, uh, I have to say he said something along the lines of, well, um, 
there were those within the Catholic Church who didn't go along with what the Catholic Church necessarily said. They didn't necessarily believe what the Catholic Church said. But that was it. That was the best answer he had. Well, the reality is, later on, doing my own study, my own research, I discovered that there were plenty of other churches throughout Europe during the Middle Ages that were not even associated with the Catholic Church. But you don't hear about that in history. You're certainly not going to read it in any secular textbook. You're not going to hear it talked about in uh, Hollywood or any of those other entertainment areas as well. So the average person is left to assume, like most Christians do, that during the Middle Ages there were no Bible-believing churches until the Protestant Reformation came around in the 1500s. So somewhere between 500 and 1500, for a thousand years, the average Christian is led to believe you were either a Catholic or you weren't anything. But that simply is not the case. And you're going to see that as we continue this study. There's another question, though, that comes up. In the day in which we live, there's a plethora of different Bibles in the English language, and seemingly a new translation comes out every other week. But these Bibles are not all alike. In spite of the claim by most pastors, Bible bookstores, and seminaries, there are much bigger differences between the modern versions being translated into English today and the historic King James Version than just updating the language. Now, I say that because if you walk into the average Christian bookstore and tell them you want to get a Bible for someone, they're probably going to walk you over to the NIV or the ESV or the NASV, one of those other versions. And if you ask them to direct you to where the King James Bibles are, they're probably going to say something like this. Well, yes, we can show you where those are, but the... The other versions are just, they're the same as the King James. They just have updated English language. They have more modern words in them. And, you know, it's possible that the clerk there at the Christian bookstore may genuinely believe that because that's what he or she was told by someone else. But in reality, that's not the case at all. Because these other modern English versions, almost without exception... Uh, leave out 16 entire verses from the New Testament and a total of more than 64,000 words out of the Bible altogether. If you took those 64,000 words and put them together, they would equal more than a dozen books of the Bible all totaled up together. Now, how many people want to read their Bible knowing that about 12 books of the Bible have been left out? I certainly wouldn't want to sit down and read a Bible that that was the case. And yet the average person is led to believe that the only difference between these modern versions and our King James Bible is it's all the same. They just updated the words. They just updated the language. That's not the case. What you're going to see as we go through is that those Bibles from which those modern versions were translated, they have a history behind them. And the history behind those Bibles goes all the way back to the 4th century, maybe even the 3rd century. But they came from a a very nefarious origin. And we'll see the origin of those Bibles. There's a play on words, Brother Mike. We'll see the origin of those other Bibles during the course of this study. So what you're going to see over the next several weeks is the history of two churches. The history of the true church, Bible-believing Christians, that has always existed since the days of the apostles. And parallel with that is the history of a false church. A church that teaches and preaches some other plan of salvation than what the Bible teaches. Those Bible-believing churches and that line of Bible-believing churches through history has always had a perfect copy of the Word of God from one generation to the next. But so too has that false line of churches had their own Bibles all the way from their beginning as well. And that's the reason that we're going to see two different lines of churches 
and two different lines of Bibles as we go through church history. It is a tale of two churches and a tale of two Bibles. Does it really matter? I mean, even if there are verses that are left out of the modern versions, and even if there are a bunch of words that are left out, I mean, does it really matter? As long as, as, long as what is left over is agreed upon as the Word of God, does it really matter? Well, first of all, there are a lot of words that not only have been taken out, but words that have been changed as well. But in addition to that, the simple answer is, yes, it does matter. And here's the reason that it matters. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13 and going forward, says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, it is of the utmost necessity that we have the actual very Word of God, not only for ourselves, but for sharing it with the lost. Because it is the Word of God that brings about faith in the unbelieving. It's it's faith that is, is generated by the written Word of God. So does it matter? It absolutely matters whether the Bible is the very Word of God or just part of the Word of God. Now, as we begin, we're going to see some principles. And what I'm doing tonight is really laying the foundation for what we're going to see the next three weeks. But if we don't lay a good foundation, then everything else I share with you isn't going to make as much sense and it's not going to be as valuable to you. The really fun stuff starts next week, but we've got to lay the foundation this week. So, (laughs) principles related to the Scriptures. We have to start out with an understanding of these principles if we're going to understand where we get to at the end of the story. Number one, God does not change and neither does His Word. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Matthew 24, verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God has given man His Word, and whatever God's Word was when He first gave it to man, that's still His Word today. God doesn't change. Who He is doesn't change. And the rules by which He's going to judge mankind one day haven't changed. What uh, What an awful thing it would be what an awful God He would be if He gave us the rules, mankind that is, and said these are the rules, and then later on He changed the rules without telling us. Boy, that nobody wants to uh, live in that kind of a situation. That's not playing fairly. But the reality is we don't have to worry about that because our God doesn't change and His Word doesn't change. Number two, God's desire in giving man His Word is that man might know His mind and will regarding salvation and obedience. It's like I just said, God gives us His Word so that we can obey Him, so that we can please Him, so we can do what He tells us to do. He doesn't just leave us in the dark, I hope you figure it out down there. No, He has given us His Word for a specific reason. Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And then Romans 10.17, we've already seen, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have to be able to have a copy of the word of God to know what God says about things, to know what He expects of us. 
He would be a very capricious God indeed if He just expected us to figure it out on our own without telling us what the rules were. Rule number three. To that end, or because of those things, God has divinely inspired His Word to mankind. That is, He gave man His Word in the original form exactly the way He intended it to be. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when God originally inspired the written Word of God, those original writings were the very words of God for mankind. Okay, but that brings us to the question then, Well, yes, I don't have any trouble believing that the original words written down by the prophets and the apostles, I don't have any trouble believing those were the very Word of God, but we don't have those anymore. No one has those anymore. The originals don't exist anymore. They've been lost or destroyed over time. They wore out over time. No one has the originals anymore. So where do we go from there? Principle number four. The preservation of God's Word is essential to accomplish His purpose in giving it. And His power of preservation is equal to His power of inspiration. You see, if God's original purpose in giving man His Word was so man could know His will and obey it, it wouldn't make sense to give us His Word and then just say, okay, y'all do your best to hang on to it because you and I know how sinful men are. Even the best of us make mistakes, mess things up. If it was left to mankind, even believing mankind, to keep a a perfect copy of His Word, we would have lost it a long time ago. And can I tell you that that's what a lot of liberal supposed Christians believe is what happened? They believe that the original manuscripts of the Bible were inspired by God but they think that somewhere along the line it was lost and all we can do today is kind of guess which parts of the Bible are still the Bible. That we're left without a perfect copy of the Bible anymore. That's not the case. For that would totally do away with God's purpose in giving it to us in the first place. If He gave it to us because it had to be divinely given, it only makes sense that... He is going to divinely preserve it for every generation. Otherwise, every generation that came after the first generation to have it wouldn't have it anymore. It would have been messed up and uh, thrown away or uh, changed long ago. But God has promised to preserve His Word. Not only to preserve it in heaven, but to preserve it on earth for us. Psalm 12 verses 6 and 7 says, "...the words of the Lord are pure words." As silver tried in a furnace of earth, uh, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. In Matthew 19, 26, it says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, God can do anything. When He gave man His written word, He has preserved His written Word. Yes, He has used mankind when He originally gave it. He used human authors to sit down with a pen or a quill and write the Word of God. But He has also used men to preserve His Word. Every generation of believers since the day He gave the originals have always had a perfectly preserved copy of the Word of God. Now, does that mean that every copy of the Bible that's ever been copied since then was accurate? No. But He has promised there would always be in every generation a perfectly preserved copy. We just have to look in the right place to find it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But yes, 
His power to preserve His Word is no less than His power to inspire it in the first place. And last of all is principle number five. The Word of God can only be understood through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. That is, if a person is lost, they're not saved, they don't have the Holy Spirit of God living within them, then there are certain things that are in this book that they're just not going to be able to understand. They might be the smartest person you've ever met. They might have the IQ of a genius, but if they don't have the Spirit of God living within them, they won't have the ability to understand some of the things in this book. They're going to be just like those that lived in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were some of the most brilliant lawyers of the day. But they didn't have the Spirit of God within them, and as a result, they couldn't understand some of the things Jesus said. By the way, Jesus quoted the Old Testament a lot, which means Jesus thought the Old Testament that was still around in His day was the Word of God. And so it had been preserved all the way from the Old Testament to Jesus' day. I assure you, He has preserved it to our day as well. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So all of those pointy-headed professors who think they're intelligent, who want to take all the manuscripts that we still have uh, from ancient times in Greek and Hebrew and spread them out on the table in front of them and say, uh, I think that one is dependable. I don't think that one is dependable. Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm not going to let anyone who is not a Bible-believing, born-again Christian tell me which ones are the Word of God and which ones are not the Word of God. And you shouldn't do that either. If they're not uh, Bible-believing Christians, born-again Christians, you know, they can give us their best academic opinion if they want to, but they lack the spiritual discernment of the Spirit of God to understand the spiritual principles that are at play. They might understand the literary principles, but the Bible's not an average piece of ordinary literature. It is a divinely inspired work and spiritual principles are at play. The Bible promises that there will always be a remnant of believers in every generation. In in the days of Elijah, Elijah the prophet thought that he he was the last one in all of Israel that still worshiped the true and living God. In fact, that's what he said. He threw up his hands and said to God, Lord, I'm the only one that still believes in you and they seek my life. Paul records in Romans 11 verse 5 that this is what God's response was to Elijah way back there in the Old Testament. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. You see, God told Elijah that there were still 7,000 men in all of Israel that had not bowed the knee to knee to Baal, the false god. Elijah didn't know that, but there were still 7,000 believers in Israel, men, besides their families, I'm assuming. But Paul says, adding to what God told Elijah, even so at this present time also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul confirms what God said to Elijah as still being true today, that In every period of time, there will always be a remnant of those who remain true and faithful to the God of the Bible. Their number might be few at times, but there will always be a remnant of true believers. And it is that remnant that God is using not only to share the gospel with the rest of the world that's lost, but to preserve a pure copy of the Word of God. So what you and I have to do, if we want to know which of those Bibles is true, we've got to find that remnant and trace their history and stay with that to come up at the end with the right Bible to be using as well. Here are some quotes. These are old quotes, some of them dating back to before the time of the Protestant Reformation, as in the case of the first one. 
One of the groups of Baptists we'll be talking about over the next few weeks are the Waldensians. Uh, the Waldenses or Waldensians, they date back literally to the days right after the apostles. And we can trace their history all the way up to the present, in fact. But one Waldensian document of 1404 says what I just said, talking about a remnant of believers in every generation. They say, We do not find anywhere in the writings of the Old Testament that the light of truth and holiness was at any time completely extinguished. There have always been men who walked faithfully in the paths of righteousness. Their number has been at times reduced to a few, but has never been altogether lost. Now that's in the Old Testament. I assure you it's the same in the New Testament. There might have been times that believers were persecuted and martyred to the point that they were few in number, but there's never been a time that they were totally extinguished altogether from the face of the earth. Jean-Paul Perrin, in his book on the Waldensian Baptist from 1618, by the way, I have a copy of that book at home. He said, God hath never left himself without witness. In the midst of the most grievous persecution... He strengthens them, making them to know that the cross is profitable, even when the faithful by means thereof exchange earth for heaven. For the children of God are not left when massacred or burned by an unrighteous judgment, since in the blood of the martyrs we find the seed of the church. One of the interesting things we'll see as we talk about church history over the next few weeks is that whenever true Bible-believing Christians are persecuted and even martyred, it normally results in two things happening. The first thing is that they spread out to other places to escape the persecution. The second thing is that everywhere they go when they flee the persecution, they take the gospel with them, which is what you and I would do if we were forced to flee. We would take the gospel with us and share it with those wherever we ended up. And persecution, even martyrdom, has always been the thing that caused the church to grow and to flourish because it ultimately ended up in resulting in the spread of the gospel to places that it had not gone before. Samuel Miller, writing on uh, Perrin's history of the Waldenses, says this, The promise of the Savior to His apostles was that the gates of hell should never prevail against His church. This promise seems to secure to His people that there shall be in all ages and in the worst of times a true and substantially pure church. That is, there shall always be a body of people more or less numerous who shall hold fast the doctrines and order of Christ's house in some good degree in conformity with the model of the primitive church. He says there will always be churches that are patterned after the New Testament churches found in the New Testament. By the way, I know one of those churches. I happen to be a member of it. It's Pinnacle Baptist Church. And there are still churches today that are patterned after those New Testament churches from the book of Acts. Writing in 1894 about the medieval English Baptist churches that were around in England before the Protestant Reformation... James uh, Kenworthy says of the church at Hillcliff, England, it is generally acknowledged now by all learned men that in all ages of the Christian era there have been found bodies of Christians under different names who have practiced and upheld the doctrines and principles which the Baptists now hold. He says we can see through history there have always been groups, maybe called by different names, but they all believed throughout history exactly what Baptist churches today believe. He wrote that in 1894 about Baptists that were around in the 14 and 1500s in England before the Protestant Reformation, the church at Hillcliffe. And I assure you there are still those kind of churches around the world today besides Pinnacle Baptist Church. But it's not just those who are Baptists who have said there have always been Baptist churches in every generation. I'm about to show you some quotes from other denominations, the historians and theologians from other denominations, who also readily admit that even though their denomination started later, Baptists have always been around and we can't even trace their beginnings because they go back to the apostles. 
Look at what these other men of God had to say. The first one, well, he's actually not a man of God, but he's, he's a Roman Catholic priest who presided over the Council of Trent in 1545. This Catholic historian said, were it not that the Baptist have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past 1,200 years, they would swarm in greater number than all the reformers. Now when he is writing this, or when he said this, this was during the Protestant Reformation, 1545. The Protestants had just left the Catholic Church. He says, if it weren't for the fact that we've persecuted Baptists for the last 1,200 years there'd be more of them than there are Protestants. Well, wait a minute. If he said that in 1545, and he admits that the Catholic Church has been persecuting Baptists for 1,200 years, that puts this all the way back to the beginning of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was started around 325 A.D. So he says since the beginning of the Catholic Church, we've been... We've been persecuting Baptists. He admits the Baptists were around when the Catholic Church was started, and they've been persecuting Baptists the entire time. What he doesn't say is that, well, the Baptists were already around when they started the Catholic Church. But here he is, a Catholic, admitting that Baptists have been around at least as long as the Catholic Church has been around. The second one here is a, uh, a famous historian of the Lutheran denomination, Moshem, and he says the true origin of that sect which acquired the denomination of Anabaptist by their administering anew the rite of baptism to those who came over to their communion is hidden in the depths of antiquity and is of consequence extremely difficult to be ascertained. He said, we don't really know when the Anabaptists started because uh, as far back as we can see in church history, they've been around. He went on to say, Before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay secreted in almost all the countries of Europe, particularly in Bohemia, Moravia, Switzerland, and Germany, many persons who adhered tenaciously to their doctrine. That is, Baptist doctrine. Here's a Lutheran historian saying, Way before the Protestants ever left the Catholic Church, the Baptists have been around for centuries, as far back as we know. The founder of the Campbellites, which is the Christian church denomination today and the Church of Christ denomination today, Thomas Campbell, he said this, I would engage to show that baptism as viewed and practiced by the Baptists had its advocates in every century up to the Christian era. And independent of whose existence, the German Anabaptists, Clouds of witnesses attest the fact that before the Reformation from Popery and from the apostolic age to the present time, the sentiments of Baptist and the practice of baptism have had a continued chain of advocates and public monuments of their existence in every century can be produced. You see, there are some who want to say that the Baptists started during the Protestant Reformation. Well, there were some groups called Baptists that did start during the Protestant Reformation. But there were Baptists and Anabaptists all the way back, he says, to the days of the apostles. He's a Campbellite. Uh, this one at the bottom, you can't see his name. His name is Robert uh, Barclay. He's a Quaker historian. And he says this, We shall afterwards show the rise of the Anabaptists took place prior to the Reformation. And there are also reasons for believing that on the continent of Europe, small hidden Christian societies who have held many of the opinions of the Anabaptists have existed from the times of the apostles. It seems probable that these churches have a lineage or succession more ancient than that of the Roman church. Here's a Quaker historian admitting that I'm not a Baptist, but it looks like there have been Baptist churches around since the days of the apostles before the Catholic church ever got started. Now, I don't have it up here because of time's sake and space's sake on the slide, but the same could be said of uh, some of the famous Presbyterian historians as well. In the uh, Presbyterian Encyclopedia, they say almost the exact same thing word for word that uh, the Lutheran historian has said about Baptist always existing. So here's what we have to do in order to see 
and follow this line of Baptist churches throughout history. Because they're not always called Baptist. Because most of the time the names they're called by are the names that were given to them by their enemies who were usually the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, in an attempt to make them look like just some new thing, came up with different names all the time for them. But what we need to know is were there churches who believe what Pinnacle Baptist Church believes today in every generation back to the apostles. So what we're going to identify to finish up today is what are the marks of a New Testament church? What is it that a church has to believe and practice to be a New Testament church? I think you'll recognize these things. They're a lot like a church you attend. So marks of the New Testament church. Now, there are some who list five things, seven things, ten things that are marks of a New Testament church. To try to make it easy, I've made an acrostic here using the name Baptists down the left. Each one of those letters is going to represent a Baptist distinctive uh, but it's really the mark of any New Testament church. And I will say at this point, there are churches, even today, that are not Baptist, that are New Testament churches. But there aren't a lot of them. Any church, though, that practices these things that we're going to see that are marks of a New Testament church, they are a legitimate, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching New Testament church, even if they don't call themselves Baptist. Most of the time, they will refer to themselves as being Baptistic, even if they're not Baptist in name. All right, so let's see what are these marks of a New Testament church. Uh, and this will be the, the final part of our study for tonight. The first one is believer's baptism. Well, what is believer's baptism? Well, believer's baptism... <coughs> says that only believers are to be baptized. In other words, we don't baptize anyone unless they're born again. Number two, it's only voluntarily done. We don't baptize anyone unless they want to be baptized. Number three, it's only after salvation. If somebody says, well, I've already been baptized, after, after they, they, they come forward, they pray, they accept Christ, and... We begin to talk to them about baptism and they say, well, I've already been baptized when I was uh, little. Well, no, I'm sorry. You got dunked in the water or sprinkled by water, but you didn't get baptized. The baptism only happens after salvation. Anything before that was just getting wet. And number four, it's only by immersion. The reality is the word baptize is not even an English word. It's a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo means to immerse, to dunk. So in reality, there is no other mode of baptism but immersion because that's what the word literally means, is to immerse. It also is used because it's the only mode of baptism that can accurately portray what Christ did for us in His death, burial, and resurrection. And it is the only mode of baptism that can adequately show what happened in my life when I got born again. I was walking along like anybody else. I was uh, buried with Him in death and raised in newness of life when I was baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, according to Paul in Romans chapter 6. So baptism by immersion is the only mode of baptism that is biblical. Look at this passage from Acts chapter 8. It's where Philip is uh, he's sharing the gospel in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch. It's probably my favorite, favorite passage dealing with both salvation and baptism because they're right there together and Philip makes it real clear. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Now, I want to stop here and say, the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't just saying he believed that Jesus is God, and Philip said, okay, as long as you believe Jesus is God, that's enough to get baptized. You're already saved. No. If you read the context just before this, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53 from the Old Testament about Jesus on the cross. Philip had already explained to him the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So when he tells the Ethiopian eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, what he's saying is if you believe what I just showed you about the death, the burial, and the resurrection, if you believe that with all your heart, you can be baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. They went down into the water because there had to be enough water to dunk him under the water and bring him back up. Uh, Else they could have just stayed in the chariot. He could have taken his canteen or whatever they had similar to a canteen, and Philip could have sprinkled a little bit of water on that Ethiopian's head and pronounced him baptized, but he wouldn't have been baptized. Or he could have poured a little bit of that canteen water into a drinking cup and poured it on that Ethiopian's head and said, you're now baptized. But that wouldn't have been baptism either. They had to stop. And isn't it interesting, God made sure they were going by uh, a place over there on the side of the road where there was enough water to dunk somebody. And they stopped the chariot and he dunked him in the water. So only someone who is saved can be baptized. They have to be being baptized by their own choice, just like getting saved by their own choice. It only comes after salvation, otherwise it's not truly baptism. And it's only by immersion, or it's not truly baptism. So that's what believer's baptism is. In churches that are true New Testament churches, only practice believer's baptism. (coughs) A church that practices baptism any way other than this is not a New Testament church. Here's the second point. The authority of Scripture. That is, the, the Bible is our final authority. Scripture is the final authority in all matters. Not just on theology, but even when it comes to biblical cosmology. Even when it comes to science. Even when it comes to history. Even when it comes to archaeology, whatever the Bible speaks on, it is correct and is the final word. It is infallible and inerrant. It has no errors. It is inspired by God. And the Scripture, particularly the New Testament, is the rule book for the church and New Testament believers. In fact, I could take it a step further than that and say this. Although all of the Gospels that contain the life and words of Christ are good for us to learn, it is the writings of the Apostle Paul that should concern us the most. Preacher, why would you say the writings of Paul instead of the Gospels about Jesus? Well, because it was to Paul who was committed the mystery of the church. And it is Paul who was given the commands for the church, for the setting up of the church, uh, and for Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles and the apostle to whom the mystery of the church was committed. The reality is we have a church constitution and bylaws at Pinnacle Baptist Church, but we could have just foregone that and said, listen, we're we're not going to write a church constitution because we already have a church constitution. It consists of all the writings of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. That's our church constitution. And you'll see as we go through over the next few weeks, one of the groups of Baptists in history are actually called Paulicians because they paid so much respect to the writings of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. As I said a couple of months ago in another uh, Bible study, That's why if somebody were to call me today a Paulician, I would just say thank you and keep right on going. That wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you know the verses. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, that's mistyped, truly furnished unto all good works. So, the second mark of a New Testament church is the authority of Scripture. If a church puts anything equal to or higher than the authority of Scripture, it's not a biblical New Testament church. If they put tradition as being equal to the Bible, they're not a New Testament church. If they put the words of Joseph Smith or Ellen G. White or anybody else equal to the Bible, they're not a Bible-believing New Testament church. If they think that the words of the Pope are equal or greater in authority than the Bible... They're not a local New Testament church. Here's the third mark of a New Testament church, the priesthood of the believer. Well, preacher, what do we mean by the priesthood of the believer? First of all, Jesus is our great high priest and mediator. The Bible tells us that throughout the New Testament. Uh, in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We don't go any longer through a a priest like the children of Israel went through Aaron and his sons after him. We go straight to God through Jesus. But the Bible says Jesus broke down the wall of partition between us and God. Ephesians 2 verse 13 and 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Well, between us who? Between us and God. Because of Jesus, believers may now come boldly to the throne of God. As we talked about in our Sunday school class in the book of Exodus, Aaron was the high priest and his sons were the other priests of Israel Well, under the New Testament, Jesus is our high priest and all of us are priests under the great high priest. We're all priests. Look what Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16 say. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One of the great things about being a New Testament Christian is that we don't have to go through a man to get to God. We can pray directly to God ourselves. I don't have to go to uh, the local bishop. I don't have to go to uh, the right reverend so-and-so over in Decatur, Georgia. I don't have to go to uh, the Pope or the Catholic Church or anybody else to pray for me or to get forgiveness of my sins by going through another man, another person. I can go myself as a believer in Christ directly to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the ways the Catholic Church and other religions have held people in tight control and bondage for centuries is teaching and preaching that you had to go through them to get to God. Any any supposed church that tells you you have to go through anybody through them to get to God, they're not a Bible-believing New Testament church. You can go directly to God yourself. Here's the next mark of a New Testament church. There are two ordinances of a New Testament church, and that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. By the way, the word ordinance is not the same as the word sacrament. The Catholics and the Protestants all call them sacraments, but they're not sacraments. The word sacrament means something with saving grace. That is, they believe that those two things help save a person. I'm going to tell you right now, baptism doesn't help save a person, and the Lord's Supper doesn't help save a person. As a Christian, should you do both of those things? Yes, you should. But they don't save you, and they don't help keep you saved. They're not sacraments, but they are commands that God gave us to do them, to observe them. And as commands... 
We call them ordinances, which is another word for a command or a law. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus commanded baptism. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, the Apostle Paul talks about the Lord's Supper as well as the passage we just saw on baptism. I'm not going to read that passage, but you can mark it down and, and read it later. The Lord commanded that we observe His Last Supper with the Apostles, and as often as we do it, we're to remember His death, burial, and resurrection because the bread is a picture of His body that was given for us. The, the fruit of the vine is a picture of His blood that was shed for us, which is the reason there's no leavening in the bread, no fermentation in the fruit of the vine, because Jesus was without sin. Fermentation and leavening in the Bible are pictures of sin. So as a Bible-believing church, we do not use bread that has leavening in it when we observe the Lord's Supper. Likewise, we don't uh, use the fruit of the vine that is fermented, but we use unfermented. Welch's grape juice, because Jesus' blood had no sin and there is no fermentation. The next mark of a New Testament church, we're coming to the end here, the independence of the local church. Now, that simply means that <clears throat> there's no one outside of Pinnacle Baptist Church other than the Lord Jesus Himself that tells Pinnacle Baptist Church what to do. There's nobody in Atlanta that's going to pick up the phone and call down here and tell Pinnacle Baptist Church what we're going to do on any matter. There's no one in Nashville that's going to pick up the phone and call down here and say, listen, uh, we know y'all are a Baptist church, so here's the word out of Nashville. This is what all Baptist churches are supposed to do. We're not, that's not going to happen. There's not going to be anybody in Rome, Italy that's going to call over here and say, hey, all churches, uh, we've just gotten word from the Pope, all churches are to do thus and such. Well, no, sorry, that's not going to happen at Pinnacle Baptist Church because the only head of Pinnacle Baptist Church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all serve under Him. He's the great shepherd. Your pastor is called the under-shepherd in the New Testament. And all of us, including your pastor, are supposed to be servants to each other. Serving God. Our rules we follow are in this book. We don't have anybody else, no denomination, no bishop, no uh, apostles. They're all dead and gone. No popes. Nobody outside of Pinnacle Baptist Church, apart from Jesus Christ, has the authority to tell Pinnacle Baptist Church what to do. Jesus is the head and founder. It is to the church that Jesus gave His authority. And each local assembly is autonomous and independent under the headship of Christ, each with its own pastor, deacons, and responsibilities. Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. He saith unto them, By whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Catholics use this passage to say that Jesus was saying He was going to build His church on Peter because the name Peter means a little stone. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus asked uh, Peter for his profession of faith, Who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, in a play on words, said, Your name is Peter, a little stone, but on this 
boulder on this huge rock, your statement that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, on that statement, I'm going to build my church. He wasn't saying he was going to build his church on Peter. He said he was going to build his church on that statement that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so um, Jesus said he was going to build his church. Acts 14, 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. So everywhere Paul and Silas and Barnabas started churches on their missionary journeys, they appointed pastors and deacons in every one of those churches. Why? Because every one of those churches was uh, an autonomous, independent church. Now, I will say it doesn't mean that churches of like faith can't work together for different things. But at the end of the day, no one has the authority to tell Pinnacle Baptist Church what we will or won't do, save Jesus Christ. The autonomy or independence of the local church. Here's the next one. Separation. State separation, ecclesiastical separation, and personal separation. Separation of church and state. Baptists do not believe that anyone should be coerced to do anything. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved, that should be your choice. Not because someone uh, held a gun to your head and forced you to do it. Uh, held a tax bill to your wallet and said, uh, you, you will become a Christian and you will pay tithes to this and this church. No. As Baptists, we believe that a person gets saved by their own free will. And if they choose to get baptized, they get baptized by their own free will. If they choose to give to their church, they give to their church by their own free will. God loveth the cheerful giver. Baptists are the reason that the First Amendment exists in the U.S. <coughs> Bill of Rights as part of our Constitution. When these United States was being formed under the current Constitution... There was a proposal that was put forth to allow the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, I think the Congregationalist Church, and the Baptist Church to all be sponsored by the state. That is, they would all be supported with tax dollars from the different states. And the Baptists were the only ones who spoke up and said, uh-uh, no, we don't want that. We're not going to give you our money for those other churches, and we don't want your money for our churches. Because Baptists believe in a separation of church and state. We don't believe that the state should force anyone to do anything against their will. In Sweden the Baptists had become very numerous at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And there was an effort to make Baptists the state religion, the state church of Sweden. The Baptists said, no, we don't want that. That's not God's plan. By the way, the separation of church and state is not what you and I have been told it is in modern times. The separation of church and state doesn't mean Christians can't participate in the government. It means the state's supposed to stay out of the church, not the other way around. The Baptist hired Patrick Henry, a lawyer from Virginia, to lobby on their behalf to have the First Amendment added to the Bill of Rights and to have state religion struck down so that there would be no national denomination in these United States. By the way, it didn't stop the states from being able to do that if they wanted to because there were still official religions in some of the states even after the Constitution was ratified. But there was no national <coughs> denominations sponsored by the government. Ecclesiastical separation says that our church will not participate in anything with other churches that are heretics or apostates. If they believe and teach false doctrine, 
We don't have anything to do with them. We don't fellowship with them. We don't combine monies to do projects together. We don't go build uh, buildings together or win souls together. If they're apostates and heretics, we separate from them, which is what the Bible commands. Personal separation means that as a Christian, I'm supposed to live separate from sin and unto God, unto holiness. Matthew twenty two twenty one. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Romans sixteen seventeen. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So all these promise keeper movements and all these other ecumenical movements are of the devil. They're not biblical. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Marks of a New Testament church. Next to the last one is two offices of pastor and deacon. We don't have any other offices in the local New Testament church but pastor and deacon. The pastor is the under-shepherd of the local church. And by the way, in the New Testament, he's called interchangeably by three different terms. They're all the same man. He's called pastor, elder, bishop. It's all the same person. I had one preacher when I was growing up, he described it this way. He said that uh, the elder is a term for the man himself. Bishop is a term for the office that he holds because the word bishop means overseer. And pastor is his job description. It comes from the same word as pastoral, rural, countryside. It's literally the same word as shepherd. So that's his job description is to shepherd the local flock. The other office of the New Testament church is the deacon. The deacon is a servant to his local church, particularly ministering to widows and orphans, but others as well in the local church. The deacon is not a position of leadership or oversight, but a position of servanthood. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. I won't read all of these. You can read them later. But this is the Apostle Paul listing the two offices of a local church and describing the qualifications of a man that would serve in either of those two roles. And last of all, the final mark of a New Testament church is a saved membership and soul liberty. Well, preacher, what do you mean by that? Well, we mean that only saved folks may be members of the church. The word church in Greek is ekklesia, which means a called out assembly. We don't allow anybody to be a member of Pinnacle Baptist Church unless they're first saved. That's one of the reasons there was such a problem in colonial America before the Great Awakening revival took place in the 1730s. They had been letting people join the roles of the church just because their parents were members of the church before them. Well, we don't do that. You have to give a testimony of being saved, born again, to become a member of a New Testament church. Number two, no one can be coerced into accepting Christ as Savior, nor should they be. We're not going to do like the Mohammedans and go around with the sword and say, uh, convert or die. No, we're not going to do that. If they want to be saved, we want them to be saved. If, they're not, if they choose not to be saved, we're still going to try to witness to them to get saved, but we're not going to force them to be saved. You can't force someone to be saved. Believers must be persuaded in their consciences that they are following the Word of God as directed by the Spirit. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I can't make your spiritual decisions and you can't make mine. But whatever you choose, you should be fully persuaded in your own mind. Judging the manuscripts, the, the line of Bibles that go along with the line of churches. The two men, Westcott and Hort, that are pictured here, in 1881, they broke with the King James Bible and the manuscripts that are the basis for the King James Bible, and they said, we're going to do something a different way. We're going to judge manuscripts not based on their spiritual 
lineage, but on literary criticism. They called it higher criticism. The reality is it was lower educational, lower spiritual criticism. They said, we're going to choose manuscripts that, number one, shorter is better. So if this manuscript has these 10 verses and this one only has 8, well, to make sure we've got the one that definitely is the Word of God, since we don't know if those two extra verses should be there or not, we're going to go with shorter is better. Number two, older is better. If we have two manuscripts and they disagree with each other, but one of them is older than the other one, we're going to go with the one that's older. Number three, scholarship is better. If we've got two manuscripts that disagree and one of them uh, comes, uh, we, it's just from a line of churches with no real pedigree to it, but this one comes from a well-known, well-established church with a lot of pedigree behind it, we're going to go with the one that has more scholarship pedigree behind it. Well, why did they come up with those rules? Which, by the way, they just created. The reason they came up with those rules is because those rules describe the Catholic manuscripts that disagreed with the Baptist manuscripts over nearly 2,000 years of history. They wanted to use these Catholic manuscripts, so what they did is they started with what they wanted to end up with, and that's how they made their rules. Well, let's see. These Catholic manuscripts are shorter. Well, why were they shorter? Because Catholics have been carving verses out and words out left and right, things they didn't want in there for a thousand years. Why were they older? Because the older copies of the Baptist manuscripts had been in use in churches being used to win souls and start churches. They were worn out and lost a long time ago, and they made more copies. But those copies they made were not as old as the ones that got worn out and disappeared. Well, the Catholic Church has some that are older, though. Why are theirs older? Because theirs have been sitting on the library shelf in the basement of the Vatican for a thousand years with nobody touching them. Nobody even unrolling them to see what's there to use them. They've held up better. They weren't being used to start Bible-believing churches and win souls. And, of course, they say the scholarship of the Catholic manuscripts is superior because they have the learned fathers of the Catholic Church putting their stamp of approval on those manuscripts. Well, all they did is start with the manuscripts they wanted to use and come up with rules that supported this group of manuscripts, and throughout nearly 2,000 years worth of history and proof that this other group of manuscripts, which makes up 95% of the manuscripts, they must be the wrong ones, and they threw them out. Here's my last slide. Sorry, I've got two slides. Here's the biblical principles of literary criticism. The Next to the last slide tonight. These are what the Bible says we should use to choose which Bible manuscripts are the right ones to use. The first one is the principle of association. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house. The principle of association says if someone doesn't believe Bible doctrine... That's not somebody you ought to be trusting, hanging around, going to, uh, to get your spiritual wisdom. Number two is the principle of fruit. Matthew 7, 20, Jesus said, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So the, the, the biblical principles to decide which family of manuscripts are the reliable ones is not shorter, older, more academic. No, the Bible principles are Who's associated with them? Are they Bible-believing Christians associated with those manuscripts? Or are they apostates and heretics associated with them? And number two, what's the fruit they have produced? Have they produced soul winning? Have they produced Christians? Have they produced Bible-believing churches? Or have they just been sitting on a shelf collecting dust for a thousand years? Next week, and for the next several weeks you will be introduced to some of the most exciting history you've never heard before. 
including these individuals and these groups of Baptists. I won't read them all. You can see them for yourself. It's going to be an exciting study. We had to go through what we went through tonight to lay the foundation. The exciting story of Baptist history, church history, Bible history begins next Sunday evening, Lord willing, in earnest. I promise you will never hear anywhere else the things you're going to hear if you'll be here. You won't, you won't be disappointed if you'll be here for the rest of this series. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that You would take these things that we've learned tonight, that we've seen together. Lord, help it to be a, an encouragement to those that already are members of a Bible-believing church. To those, Lord, who may be listening that are not members of a Bible-believing church, but want to be. Lord, may they see with their own eyes from the Word of God what they should be looking for to find that kind of church. Lord, I pray that You'd help all of us in these last days to be vigilant in living for You and not associating with apostasy. Lord, help us to seek out the truth and attach ourselves to it. Use us, I pray, in Jesus' name.